Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to view the full version of the talk about our research paper, Encapsulated Search Index, Public Key, Sublinear, Distributed, and Delegatable. This is joint work with folks at Atacama, David Cash at the University of Chicago, and my advisor, Yvgeny Doris at NYU. And my name is Harish, and I will be giving this talk. So before we look at Encapsulated Search Index, it we can first take a pause and look at actually searchable encryption. Searchable encryption, the motivation. What, why is it so popular? Why has it grown uh, increasingly relevant? The simple reason is remote storage has become ubiquitous, cheap and convenient. Everyone wants to store things on the cloud. For example, this very presentation is at least stored on two cloud platforms. But the flip side is that if, do we ever trust the server that we store this data on. And if you ask a bunch of cryptographers, the answer is always no, because we have severe trust issues and we typically solve by um, throwing encryption at it. And this is an elegant solution, but apparently our tools are a little too perfect because the flip side is that it does really do a good job of hiding all information about the data. And consequently, what needs to happen for us to do some operations on the data is for us to locally download and then perform the operations. So searchable encryption was devised as a paradigm or a primitive where we can actually do something cleverer we, where we will ask the server to help us perform this operation while being completely mindful of the fact that the server is untrusted. And here, all uh, operations we talk about is search and the concept is therefore searchable encryption or private searching. So what is the setting? We basically throw some additional encrypted structures, which we call as index and denoted by the letter E. Uh, so because there's encryption, you can think that there is some kind of a secret key that is involved. Now there is the role of an index creator, who is actually the person who creates the index. Search approver is someone who can control the search process, who typically controls the uh, secret key and therefore can provide information to selectively decrypt uh, the index. And finally, the storage owner is typically mod modeled as someone who is untrustworthy, um, controls the storage location on which the data is stored. So if you were to look at the data flow, you have a document that an index creator takes as input to produce an index E. This is an encrypted index E. Now, if I wanted to search uh, for a keyword W, it will take some, um, some secret information, the search approver, uh, to produce a token ZW and ZW on the index is combinedly used as an input uh, for the storage location to actually produce the matches. And here, the security that we require is something known as index privacy or token privacy, where even if I have the index in my hand and a bunch of keywords, um, sorry, tokens for a bunch of keywords, I have no information about how a token for a keyword W prime uh, looks like if I have never seen it before. And that is the goal that we want is for uh, privacy of uh, indices that have not been uh, queried yet, or keywords that have not been queried yet. And in this setting, we ask the question, can we achieve sublinear search time and public key indexing? The former is very attractive for the simple reason that a lot of the data structures that are out there can uh, support search operations in sublinear time. A Bloom filter can do it in expected constant time, whereas balanced search trees will do worst case uh, log in the size of the uh, tree or the number of entries stored in the data structure. And public key indexing will have, uh, will have the feature of supporting multiple index creators. So there is no bottleneck where I'm reliant on explicitly one single person to do the job. So specifically, we look at this um, construct are these two features of our searchable encryption primitive uh, in this particular setting where most documents actually do not change. That is immutable. So what does it mean is that once it's created, it's there. And this gives us the powerful tool of ensuring that our index need not be created incrementally. So I have it, I can be done with it uh, by creating an index. And Consequently, what it also means is that I can have document-specific tokens. What do I mean by that? It means that I have tokens for keywords that are specific to this document. So we do not need this feature of universal indexing, or what we at least call as universal indexing, where one single 
token can be used for any key uh, for the same keyword across any number of documents. But, okay. So we have the setting where the user has two devices, a phone and a desktop. The desktop is really powerful, but insecure. So what I do is I use the day, a desktop to actually handle sensitive documents and I index it separately and then I really remove the data because I can't leave it sitting. So as long as I have control over it, I can trust that it's not corrupted. And then if I want to uh, use uh, uh, the index to search on the index, I need the phone to authorize the search and security goal as discussed before, is index privacy. And we also want the feature of delegation. That is, we want to support multiple search of keywords. So we allow an encrypted index that's built for a particular document D using a paired secret key, uh, public key pair, SK, comma, PK, to be actually searched by another secret key, public key pair, SK prime, PK prime, but without I knowing D and without modifying E. So essentially, I do not want to reinvest effort to create a new index E prime, but I rather I would still use the same E, but I would just delegate the search process alone. Now, this is the setting. Uh, this is the story that we are telling. This is the motivating application for which encapsulated search index makes sense, where we have immutable documents and we want to achieve sublinear search with support for public key indexing and delegation. So more specifically, if you were to look at the process flow, I have a mobile phone that generates public key secret key, keeps secret key for itself and sends public key to the desktop. Now the desktop with access to the public key uh, takes a document D as input and produces index E and uh, handle C, okay? And deletes the data, the original document D. So it does not have the document D anymore in its possession. Anyway, so what do we have then? We next want to search for the keyword W. So all the uh, desktop needs to do is send the handle C and the keyword W. So what do I require security wise is that it's privacy preserving. So phone learns nothing beyond W from C. So no C, it knows W. There's no other information that's gained about the index E and this should hold information theoretically. Now having received this input, uh, the phone has the capability to use the secret key SK and the compact representation uh, or the handle C and the word W to actually produce a talk document, um, sorry, a token uh, ZW for the keyword W. And to be specific, it's also specific to the index E comma C for this document. So this token is unique to this document uh, or rather to this E comma C value, okay? And then what I want is the, adver the desktop will now receive ZW as input and we require the desktop to be empowered with the, with the feature of verifying if ZW is correctly formed. So we do not want the desktop to produce wrong output. The most the phone can do is produce a denial of service attack. And then we also want token privacy or key uh, index privacy, where I give you a document, uh, I give you a document D, and I produce a token ZW for the keyword W in this document D. Then I have no information about W prime that's not uh, um, that's different from W, but is present in the document D. But also for the same W that occurs in any other document D. So in both these counts, we critically require uh, privacy. And finally, the feature that we desire is that the same public key secret key pair can be used for different documents. So E comma C is essentially unique to a document D. So I can use it to compute E prime comma C prime for a document D prime and so on and so forth. Now, the most important feature is that there is communication that's happening between the desktop and the phone. And we require that this communication for the search procedure between the desktop and the phone should be constant. So critically note that I sent only C and W which are constant in size and not the entire index E because E can be as large as the number of keywords in a document. Now, these are the required properties and the required process flow but and the formal syntax is as seen here, and I have a gen algorithm that will generate public key secret key and the index algorithm that will actually produce the encrypted index uh, E and 
a compact representation or a handle C. So I just use spool for us to split this index procedure as two sub algorithms. One is called the prep algorithm or the prepared algorithm, which takes us input PK and produces S and C. Think of S as a trap door and C as the handle. And build index will take this trap door and the original document D to produce E. And here the E is the index for D and C is some compact representation, which is the only thing that needs to be sent for the search approver to uh, provide a token. Now a search process will take as will take as input the secret key, the E prime comma C prime, and the keyword W and produces a bit that's either zero or one, indicating if W was actually present in document D prime, for which E prime and C prime are the index and the compact representation. Again, for simplicity, we have taken a modular approach in defining algorithms uh, where we have split the search procedure into three sub procedures. Now, this is not important, but the important part here is that we achieve privacy preserving unconditionally. And that is the feature of separating the index algorithm to two sub algorithms, the prepare and the build index. And the C that is produced, the compact handle that is produced uh, is independent of the document D. So therefore, even if I give you the secret key, D naught and D one, I will not be able to determine uh, which of the two documents uh, was encrypt was indexed. And um, that is the key part here where we achieve privacy preserving unconditionally uh, and holds in information theoretically. Okay, this is all great. How do we go about instantiating or implementing this primitive? Now, there is a naive solution there, which achieves both public key and sublinear search. And this is the solution there. Uh, whereas it does not offer all of the features, but it's a very useful launchpad for the rest of the uh, talk, how we come up with better primitives that achieves all the features that we want. Specifically that we have the phone and we have the desktop as before. The phone basically gen runs the CCA gen algorithm. So think of CCA, that is a CCA secure um, encryption algorithm. It, gen it runs the gen algorithm for this and produces public key secret key, keeps secret key for itself and sends public key to the desktop. The desktop now runs the gen algorithm for a pseudo random function. So it produces a pseudo random function key, K. And now for each keyword in the document D, it produces a token by running uh, eval of this PRF on the key K and on this input W. And then it creates a set uh, or a, a, an array of all of these keywords. Uh, sorry, all of these tokens for all of these keywords. And then I will just build an interpreted index by combining Y with some sublinear dictionary. So say I think of it as a Bloom filter or a balance search tree in which I insert values. Um, and, then, uh, and then it runs the CCA encryption algorithm to actually encrypt the PRF key K and to produce a compact handle or representation C and it deletes K. Okay, so at the end, and also deletes the document D. Uh, at the end, the desktop is left with the encrypted index E and the uh, handle C for the ciphertext C in this case. And whenever it wants to search, it will just send C and W as before. Now, the phone with knowledge of the secret key can actually decrypt the ciphertext C to get recover the PRF key K, and then simply run the PRF eval function to get ZW and send ZW to the desktop. Recall that we want a feature where verifiability was required, wherein we wanted to make sure that ZW could be verified uh, that it was correctly formed. So all we knew is replace PRF with a VRF and we're still golden. However, that does not have support for distribution and delegation, which were two key properties that we wanted. And for completely different reasons, these properties are not uh, offered by this naive scheme. And we refer you to uh, our full version of this paper uh, sorry, a full version of the paper, and also actually our, our conference uh, sub proceedings to actually read about why this is true. However, we have a good framework on which we can build it. So it almost seems like the night this the, the procedure to follow when we are creating a construction of the ESI is as follows, right? We will index W by computing a pseudo random function on W. So and when we store the value in a sublinear search dictionary because we have public key setting, we almost need two different ways to compute this PRF value. And 
We need a consistency check, which means that we need some kind of a VRF, not a PRF. So we introduce this new primitive called encapsulated verifiable random function. And this primitive has support for delegation and distribution. And that's the key point here. Whereas a naive scheme does not have these two support. So what is the syntax of EVRF? Think Alice, think Bob. Alice has public key, secret key generated, communicates public key to Bob. Now Bob has the power to run this encapsulation algorithm simply, um, which is a randomized algorithm, which takes as input public key PK and produces a trapdoor T and a ciphertext C. So now it communicates the ciphertext C to Alice and keeps trapdoor for itself. So now Alice wants to com uh, compute the EVR of value on an input X. So what does it do? It takes a ciphertext C, takes the eval, uh, takes the input X and uses a secret key to produce this value Y. Y is EVR of X. Uh, concurrently, what Bob can do is Bob has this algorithm called comp, which will take input X and the trapdoor T to produce the same exact value. So essentially we have produced a map for Alice and Bob to generate the same value y, which is EVR of x using two completely different ways. And there's just the communication of just the C, okay? So what is the security requirement? Think challenger, think adversary. Challenger runs this typical uh, gen algorithm, but in addition, it also runs the NCAP algorithm, which is the encapsulation procedure to produce a ciphertext C and the uh, trapdoor T. It communicates P, K, and C to the uh, adversary and keeps B, S, K, and T for itself. Now, the adversary has access to this uh, eval oracle, okay, where it can make queries on inputs C prime comma X, and it re receives as response the eval on C prime and X, and then finally communicates a challenge um, uh, input X star. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the challenger does the standard indistinguishability game by computing uh, um, uh, why not by using the uh, secret key SK and the trapdoor. Oh, well, just the actually the secret key SK is sufficient. Um, um, sorry, actually doesn't even, my bad. Uh, it runs this why not and why one, it computes these two values and then communicates Y underscore B to the adversary. Brilliant. And the adversary responds with B prime and wins if B prime is equal to B. Okay, this is a simple setting. And to prevent meaning, to prevent trivial attacks, we require that C and X star was never queried by the adversary. And now let us look at the construction where we have Alice, we have Bob. Alice basically picks some random element A and, and, com and computes G to the A as the public key. Uh, Bob, on the other hand, runs this NCAP procedure and communicates the ciphertext as in here. And then the, it keeps the trapdoor for itself. Now, Alice can communicate, uh, compute Y in this manner, basically takes this input, E, F, H, comma, H of C, comma, X, raised to the A, comma, C, because it knows the A value. And correspondingly, it does the, uh, Bob can do it by using the trapdoor, which where it has the powerful element S, which is nothing but A to the R or G to the AR. So essentially A to the AR will come as exponent outside and the same values hash because C is equal to R. This is a simple construction. We can prove that this is secure under the BDDH assumption in the random oracle model. Okay. So now all we have seen is we have made a case that AVRF is a primitive, it's a useful primitive. And we have shown that is a construction possible. Now let's see how to build this ESI in a generic fashion. So the key gen algorithm is merely running the EVRF key gen algorithm. And then the index procedure runs the NCAP to actually compute C comma T. And the indexing, the remaining indexing procedure is very similar to the uh, naive solution, except that instead of running PRF.eval, it will run EVRF.com and then runs the data structure build algorithm to produce an index E and then returns E and C. Now the search procedure will simply do the same thing as uh, what we saw before, instead of running evrf.eval uh, by first decrypting and then running the eval, it will just run eval on S, K and C and then run the ds.find algorithm. Now the beautiful part here is that 
we our composition result here will inherit the properties of distribution and delegation from the EVRF and we formally prove it in the paper. So what do we get out of all of this? We get threshold ESI, which achieves distributed token generation in a non-interactive manner. So we take our standard EVRF and throw verifiable secret sharing and Shamir's secret sharing. And the scheme is secure under the BDDH assumption. Now, uh, the more important feature that we wanted was that of delegatability, where I can take uh, search approver one, can delegate the search process to a search approver two without having to recreate the index. So we have this delegate algorithm that takes as input C1, SK1, and produces SK2 and C2. Uh, sorry, also as the secret key of the intended recipient, SK2, and to produce a handle or a representation C2. So this is not recreating the index, but simply more modifying the ciphertext or the handle alone. And the verification procedure will either will verify if this delegation procedure has happened correctly. Now, as we saw, saw before, uh, or rather as we stated before, delegatable ESI can be built uh, from delegatable ERF. It inherits the properties. So let's look at building a delegatable EVRF. So what do we want is again to search approval one, somehow we can delegate the process. So it, instead it will take ciphertext C1 and C2. And the correctness of the delegation requires that for every single input, the eval function is correct, essentially. And same as a useful algorithm that we will define, which will return one if this correctness of delegation passes. If PK1, C1, PK2, C2 is given, it is one if and only if the correctness of delegation passes. Okay. So now, and now I've done all of this, but I want to now discuss how do we actually build this delegatable EVRF, at least the basic thing. Okay. So recall that we have um, this has the standard EVRF construction, okay? And there are, I mean, I've, I've taken the, the diagrammatic representation and put it on a, um, on a in a textual format, okay? Now, the key idea here is separate the R. So I'm using this R twice here. So I'm once I'm using it to hash the value, and once I'm using it as a parameter for the bilinear map. So let me see, I want to separate the two process out, okay? So how do I do it? I introduce this new term called D is equal to G to the R. So essentially R is equal to D is equal to G to the R, okay? And I will also include the public key and this value D in C and T. So this is the new definition. And the delegate algorithm is this, okay? Basically thus A comma R comma D1 raised to the A1 over A2. So A1 over A2, think of it as basically A1, A2 inverse, mod of P1 or mod of P basically, the, uh, um, the, the, the prime order group that we are working with. And uh, A can now generate, however, this new ciphertext C prime as A squared comma R comma R squared. If I see this, I just need to square it. It's all public information. Now note that the minute this happens, I can now query eval on this value C prime and X star, and every check will pass, right? It will produce the correct result. And unfortunately, we need to prevent this. So the way out is to basically throw in the public key that you also get also inside the hash function. Okay, so that's the key thing here. That public key also becomes a part of the hash value here that's computed, okay? And then, so we have the delegate algorithm here. And what's the next thing that we need to do? We will throw in this additional check, okay? So what we wanna make sure is to see if um, this is essentially holds true, that the component that we get from PK and the component we get from C prime are consistent with each other, are correct. Then this is trivially true when I've not modified it, when I've not done any delegation. Otherwise, D prime is uniquely determined by A prime, R prime, and A. And it's because the check passes, right? And the reason why this big exposition is that it's okay to not include D prime in the hash because we have done A prime, we have done R prime in the hash, but we are not including D prime, but it's fine because this check passes and A prime, R prime, and A will therefore uniquely determine D prime. So it's fine to not include it. It's fine to not now verify that that is correct, fine, okay? And the final point here is about the same function because we needed the same procedure, right? So these are the terms. So PK1 is nothing but G comma A1. P2 
PK2 is G comma A2, and these are C1 and C2, right? They are different A, R, and B1, and this is some A prime, R prime, and D2. If I were honestly delegated, okay, the first two terms would be the same. So if A comma R and A prime comma R prime are the same, then it was honestly delegated. So I know that they will produce the same results. The delegation is correct, therefore it will produce the same results. Now, if A E of A1 comma D1, A1 is the public key that we are dealing with, and A2 is the public key that we're dealing with here, if this value holds, again, we know that the eval function will produce the correct result. It can be mathematically verified and we verify it in the paper, but the key point here is that the same procedure will work like this. If these two checks passes, then I will return one. Okay, and this is a basic delegatable EVRF. And here we only allow for honest delegation, which means that the adversary can only delegate uh, to a secret key or a party whose secret key does not know. And this is secure under the BDDH. Now I can take this and I can also allow for a little bit of corruption. Okay, what do I mean by a little bit of corruption is now I can specify SK2. Okay, I can specify SK2 and uh, we prove that the same construction, we have some further extensions, which will also support this extension and it's secure under BDH, BDDH, both in and out delegation. So now I can specify SK1 and ask to uh, get SK2, or I can produce SK2 and ask to an honest SK1. Both of these are possible. And we, unfortunately, we can only prove it to be secure in, the, in a very strong model, IBD, I, the interactive BDDH assumption. Uh, unfortunately, it's not well studied. So we find try to find a middle ground, which is the one time thing where only one in delegation varies allowed, but any number of out delegation. And we prove that the construction is secure under the EBDDH assumption. Now, now there's a lot of acronyms here. There's a lot of um, settings here, but the key argument here is this, right? I can, an at attacker can simply take a query that um, take a C that it receives as challenge and then asks it to basically uh, delegate it honestly to a second party. And then once the C has become C prime, it can run C prime and X star. And because we want it to be delegation correct, this will pass. You get the same value and the correctness is avoided, right? We bake the scheme trivially. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, the way around this, fortunately rather, is to use the same procedure. And that is why we require the same procedure critically, which will determine if the values that I'm playing with will actually produce the same result. Okay. Now I can do it once. I can keep doing it multiple times. At some point of time, I can do it. Um, I need to somehow re retrace the path. And that's why bidirectional support for uh, this kind of delegation uh, is quite, uh, you need some stronger assumptions to prove secure. You can check the paper for details for more expansive discussion. So now let's just basically summarize the talk. What have we done here? We introduced this primitive of encapsulated search index, which has all of the features, including the distribution and delegation. And we also introduced this primitive of independent interest called encapsulated verifiable random function which achieves this computing of PRF value through two different v, uh, two, through two different ways, which can be done by two different independent parties. And I can extend it to the distributed and delegated setting. And the basic version is secure under the BDDH assumption in the random oracle model. Now, having said all of this, I should also stress that this is commercially available. It's a product that's out there. Uh, Atacama has deployed it uh, in several companies and it's quite successful. So all of this is not purely theoretical result. We also have practical uh, efficiency um, guarantees because it's been deployed and used uh, extensively by the clients. And that's all I have time for you now. Please thank you so much for taking the time to see the full version of this talk. I'll take questions during the live proceedings. Thank you.